So I'm going to talk with you about a really, I think, a fascinating application of CERT RMM to uh, the movement of mail and the security and resilience of mail. Uh, we've had the good pleasure of working with the United States Postal Inspection Service since January of 2011, so a little over three years now. And uh, similar to my mention of Jason Christopher on the panel, Michael Ray from the United States Postal Inspection Service will be on the panel this afternoon. You'll get his perspective on how this body of work has moved forward and the benefits that the Postal Inspection Service has actually enjoyed. Whoops, I went the wrong direction. Okay. So I am the second of three case studies. I'll be followed by my colleague, Matt Bukovic, talking about uh, one of our case studies with the Department of Homeland Security. So you've kind of got right in the middle of the case study segment. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. And for our listeners in other countries, you'll have to bear with me because this work is uh, so far, although I'll be telling you a little bit about some international mail handling, has been fairly focused on U.S. domestic mail. And so, uh, but hopefully you can extrapolate to your country's areas of concerns when it has to, has to do with moving mail across, across your country and across country borders. The U.S. Postal Inspection Service is the law enforcement arm of our U.S. Postal Service, and we are fortunate to be the only country in the world that has a separate and distinct law enforcement arm, i.e. the Postal Inspection Service. And they go way back to the days of Pony Express and when mail kind of first got started, because there's, in fact, if you've seen some of the old Westerns, you know, the sheriffs or the, the postal folks riding along the train because somebody's trying to steal the mail or steal something that's being shipped via mail. Uh, the Postal Inspection Service has really been instrumental to protecting uh, the security and the safety and now the resilience of mail as it transits from the point of origin to the point of destination. And there are a couple of points here on the mission of the United States Postal Inspection Service that I'll just leave for you to read. Uh, there are over 200 uh, laws, regulations, and statutes in the U.S. that the Postal Inspection Service has to ensure are, are actually conducted and applied to the handling of the mail in areas like electronic crimes, uh, mail fraud and theft, identity theft, uh, child exploitation that can take place in the mail, uh, prohibited mailings, hazardous mailings. So it's a very daunting responsibility when you think about the volume of mail that moves across the U.S. on any given day. Uh, they have a, a very strong ethic of protecting the brand and the reputation of the U.S. Postal Service. And uh, I will be talking a little bit about their instrumental role in the global mail supply chain, because you would say, you know, why is the U.S. Postal Service and Inspection Service concerned about global mail? And you'll be uh, interested to find out the unique role they play in the handling of international mail. Uh, our sponsor for this body of work at the United States Postal Inspection Service is Gregory Crabb. He's the inspector in charge and, uh, in areas of responsibility, including revenue, product, and global security that are listed here. And, you know, it, it is such a pleasure uh, to, to work with someone who has a vision about how a body of work like RMM can actually be applied to Mail. I mean, we've been talking about infrastructure resilience and system resilience and IT and business continuity and disaster recovery, which I think we all kind of understand from a critical infrastructure perspective uh, why resilience would be important. But mail, why, why would you think about resilience of mail? And so he, he very early on uh, became familiar with this body of work. He had several of his uh, postal inspectors participate with us in the first CERT resilience management model users group where they actually came in with a, actually an improvement objective and worked through that. And he saw very early on that the benefit of a process approach to the safety and security and resilience of the mail versus a controls approach. He thought he could be a much better business partner to his postal service business units as new products were being promoted. And he thought he, this would allow him to really focus on the goals and the overall objectives and strategies of these postal service products instead of getting in the weeds on detailed controls and the costs associated with controls. 
So this is a fairly lengthy list of all the different ways in which um, uh, Mr. Crabb and ourselves uh, in support of him have actually taken parts of the model <clears throat> and applied it to a wide range of um, responsibilities that rest within his group for revenue, product, and global security. Um, the Postal Inspection Service is responsible for enforcing all the export screening laws before any mail leaves the US and goes to, out to another country. And there are over 1 million packages per week that are export screened. And any exceptions to those requirements are caught and dealt with by the Postal Inspection Service. Uh, new product security risks. Uh, one of the novel things that, uh, that they were able to do with the model, you've heard talk in, in earlier presentations about the risk management process area. And so as new mail products were being proposed by the business, uh, Greg's folks on the Postal Inspection Service side were actually to relatively quickly, sometimes in a matter of days, identify what the risks would be to the safety, security, and resilience of that new mail product before it, was at, before it actually hit the streets and help the business owner mitigate those risks. Uh, there are some others listed here. I'm going to really do a deep dive on the last three. Uh, we've actually developed or in the process of developing three mail-specific process areas so this might not be uh, quite intuitive, but uh, RMM has 26 process areas that you've heard described today. But because the mail asset as a new type of asset for resilience management is, is so unique in terms of its resilience requirements, uh, we've been asked by and have been working with the Postal Inspection Service for some time on actually developing some mail-specific process areas. So we have actually are working on three additional process areas, which you add to the 26 that are insert RMM to allow for the safe and secure handling of, of mail in a way that's consistent with uh, CERT RMM. And um, the little icon on the right-hand side of your screen is a podcast. Um, as I mentioned, I moderate the CERT podcast series, and this kind of captures a podcast I did with Greg about a year and a half ago. And I'm happy to uh, give you some breaking news. The little uh, the eye chart in the bottom right corner is a new technical note that we just released a couple of days ago that gives you much more detail than I'll be able to provide in my short time with you today about all the different things that, uh, that we have done and how CERT RMM has been applied to the objectives of the United States Postal Inspection Service. So now I'm going to uh, do a deep dive on three projects to just give you a little more tangible feel for how we've applied the model. The first one is on uh, the development of three, as I said, male specific process areas. And then what I'm going to do is follow up with how we've actually applied those new process areas to a particular type of uh, appraisal activity. So. When, when the Postal Inspection Service first took a look at the model, they could see how they could interpret aspects or process areas, some of the goals and practices, to uh, the uh, security of mail, the resilience of mail, the safety of mail, the uh, assuring uh, proper uh, revenue uh, commensurate with uh, mail being uh, accepted and transported and delivered. They could see uh, by inference. Um, how they could use CERT RMM to help them achieve some of those goals. But there were some things that were missing that were specific to the life cycle of a mail asset from the time the mail is in, they call it inducted or accepted. For all of you that, you know, we all mail things every day. So you go up to the retail counter, you hand them a piece of mail, the clerk verifies that uh, for the services that you're purchasing, that there's the right amount of postage on the mail. So this happens at the retail counter, but there's a huge volume of mail that takes place in the commercial uh, domain. A lot of the stuff that we tend to call junk mail, bulk mail, uh, uh, you know, newspapers and flyers and other things. So there's a huge volume of mail that comes in through this induction process and then is transported and delivered. And the inspection service really wanted us to try and capture and take some of the tenants of the resilience management model and really interpret them and capture them in a couple of new process areas so that there would be some common criteria. They could use these process areas to evaluate all of their business partners and other types of their customer operation and external dependencies and make sure that the mailers were complying with the various requirements for mail. Um, one of the things that we were really excited about is We've talked about the definition of resilience in other uh, presentations today, but we actually defined 
in this body of work, what it means for a piece of mail to be resilient. Uh, and I list here availability, sanctity, custody, visibility, and access. So mail needs to be available. You know, you, you, you put it into the mail stream and you expect it to show up at its destination within the service window of the service that you purchased. Uh, sanctity of the seal. Um, that's probably the best analogy is it would be commensurate with the, with the integrity aspect of information security where the, the letter that I put in the mail stream, I expect it to show up in exactly the same condition as when I mailed it to whoever I end up addressing it. Custody, there are services like registered mail where you actually have a chain of custody requirements that have to be enforced. Visibility, tracking numbers, you know, when you, when you send a piece of express mail, there's a tracking number and you can track its location at any point in time. And then access to make sure that only those authorized to have access to the mail are permitted that access. And then last but not least, and, and this is really where the rubber meets the road, how do I assess? How do I determine that in my acceptance of mail, my transportation of mail, my delivery of mail, my payment of mail, how do I assess whether or not each mail unit that is involved in the life cycle of that mail item is performing as expected? So all of this is to the end objective of being able to assess or appraise or evaluate how well that, uh, the, those uh, practices are working, and then have a common framework and a common language that can be used across the postal service and the Postal Inspection Service. So my next three slides, I'm going to talk to you about these three mail-specific process areas. And you, again, you should think of them as an adjunct or an add-on or a, 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 an additional complementary piece to the 26 process areas that make up the current uh, CERT resilience management model. So mail induction I've talked a little bit about. Here's the purpose, to ensure that all mail pieces, that's kind of the vernacular of the domestic United States Postal Service, but basically that all mail that is inducted, which means they've taken possession of it, they've collected and accepted it, that that collection and acceptance occurs in accordance with many, 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 many USPS standards. And so just as an example, there in this particular process area, there are actually, uh, I think it was uh, Jim Sabula talked about the structure of the model. We have specific goals and specific practices. In this particular PA, there are five specific goals and 13 specific practices, but I'll highlight one for you. So within the um, induct mail goal, there's an accept mail practice. And this gives you an idea of some of the kinds of things that if you were to open up this PA and read it, you would actually see at the sub-practice level. Things like um, help mailers be properly prepared to make sure that the, thing, the mail that comes into the mail stream meets those standards. Uh, block prohibited, uh, prohibited, hazardous, or improperly marked mail. Make sure the mail is eligible for the type of service it's being purchased, et cetera, and perform verification. And uh, the third bullet from the bottom is uh, essential. As some of you may know that our, our U.S. Uh, Postal Service, although not a uh, government agency, it's a quasi-commercial agency, uh, but there is actually uh, a law that requires the U.S. to have a U.S. Postal Service. Um, but they, they do run many of their services at a deficit. And so one of the big areas that they've, excuse me, asked us to help them concentrate on is to ensure that they are properly compensated for every piece of mail that they accept and deliver. And I want you to keep in mind uh, this mail induction process area and the next one I'm going to talk about because they are going to come up again in an example of an appraisal activity that we've performed that actually uses some of this new content to appraise on uh, a particular type of risk in the express mail stream. Okay, the second of three, uh, mail revenue assurance. Um, make sure the Postal Service gets paid for all the work that it does on our behalf, that it's properly compensated for every piece of mail that comes into the mail stream. And some of the sub-practices that show up in this PA are things like uh, verify that the postage that's affixed to the face of the mail piece or the face of the parcel uh, is uh, sufficient for that particular height and weight and dimension and service, depending on number of days delivered, et cetera, that the postage is not fraudulent. In the same way that we know we have a very clever intruder community in, uh, in the internet space and that the intruders are always ratcheting up their level of attack, 
uh, through the education that we received from our friends at the Postal Service, you cannot believe how clever folks are that want to commit fraud in the mail. There's lottery fraud. There's all kinds of purchase fraud. There's nation state-sponsored state fraud that comes in through the mail stream. And so part of this is fraudulent postage. You can actually take, probably shouldn't tell people how you can actually do this, but there are lots of instances of duplicate uh, labels. So you can send a piece of express mail before you send it off, copy that label, slap it on the next package with the same tracking number and the same, and you, you basically have, you know, you basically have created a situation where the postal service is not being compensated because you're using duplicate or fraudulent labels. So there's actual practices in this process area that call for rigor in uh, payment of mail, the sufficient postage, uh, and the identification of discrepancies that occur in the standards that are required to, uh, to make that all happen properly. Uh, for our folks, uh, our listeners from other countries, I'm really delighted to have an opportunity to talk about international mail. So you would s perhaps say, you're talking about the U.S. Postal Service and you're talking about the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. What is, what is their role in international mail? Well, when you think about it, any piece of mail that comes into any country, once it enters that country, it is considered domestic or national mail. And so it's to our collective advantage to make sure that that mail that's transiting country borders follows a set of guidelines and ground rules. And it turns out unbeknownst to us when we started down this path, it turns out that there is a United Nations sponsored body called the Universal Postal Union. There are 192 member countries of that union and it's their job collectively. These are postal administrations around the globe and they meet regularly to promulgate standards and good practice for the handling of international mail. And for the purposes of our definition, we're talking about mail actually leaving a country, like in my case, the US, it's actually leaving the borders of the United States and going through uh, one of the US international service, uh, service centers. And we're also talking about mail coming in from other countries. So the part of the life cycle that this process area deals with, and we are currently in active development on this process area, is from the time mail leaves a country border or comes into a country from another from another country. And so here are currently, um, based on our current design, there are six specific goals and 14 specific practices. And I would like to highlight uh, a little bit the uh, transport mail and screen mail goals. So there's lots of sortation that occurs. As I mentioned, there's on the US side, there's all these export control regulations before uh, mail can leave a country. Uh, there are certain countries that mail cannot go to without a lot of extra screening or come in from, as you might expect. Um, so there's sortation that goes on. There's customs processing that co goes on on incoming mail. Learned, uh, we, uh, we had this wonderful uh, site visit up to uh, the San Francisco uh, International Service uh, Center uh, a couple of months ago. And I didn't, even, I didn't realize this. It never occurred to me. When international mail comes into that center or any center in the U.S. that's handling international mail, it's considered international mail until it goes through customs screening. So it comes in, it goes through customs screening as international mail, and as soon as it comes out the conveyor belt at the other end of that screening process, it is considered domestic mail. And the reason that's very important in the U.S. is that customs can open a piece of mail and inspect it but by law, that cannot occur to domestic mail. So there's all these very interesting uh, chain of custody and, and uh, legal and regul regulatory steps and actions that can be taken against a suspicious piece of mail that you, they have to be very careful along this entire mail stream. Anyway, I'm getting, getting off topic a little bit here, but here are some of the practices and sub-practices about screening, identifying that mail that needs to be screened, identifying high-risk mail. Um, the Postal Inspection Service and the various airlines that transport international mail work with our Transport Security Administration, and so we actually got to see, you know, where all the dogs get involved and who can do what at what point of the life cycle, and it's a... Uh, it's really kind of an interesting behind the scenes process that none of us really realize happen on an everyday basis as we go to our mailboxes and pick up our mail. So we're having a lot of fun learning about it. Okay, looking at my time here. Good. Okay, we're good. So 
what I'm going to do now is um, tell you, so, so th that was one of the deep dive uh, applications, actually developing male-specific process areas. And that's all fine and well, but then you say, okay, I have these male-specific PAs. I've got some new goals. I've got some new practices. So what? What do I do with them? I mean, what, I, I took the time to do this development. How am I actually going to apply these? And so I'll give you one example. We have many, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you one that, uh, that uh, we've recently completed and is actually, some of it is still ongoing. In terms of um, helping the United States Postal Inspection Service identify where there are revenue risks in the express mail stream. Express mail is an international form of mail. It's in, in the U.S. You know, you can basically, basically it's next day or two day. And I think internationally, I don't know what the, what the most stringent del delivery requirement is. It's probably uh, at least uh, one or two days. And it, express mail is obviously for high priority uh, items. Um, obviously, competitors with the U.S. Postal Service for express mail would be like FedEx and UPS and others who have overnight mail delivery. Uh, but what they, be, because it's such a high priority, um, uh, there are some labor intensive parts to the handling of express mail because of its performance requirements to get to its destination in a very short period of time. They really wanted to us to help them identify where are they losing money in express mail and is there a way we can take some of these mail specific process area practices that I described to you and actually fold them into some type of an assessment instrument that uh, postal inspectors in the field, US postal inspectors and revenue fraud analysts who are looking for cases where there's big fraud, uh, uh, big fraud incidents with respect to the handling of express mail and, and actually go out to the various parts of the postal system and, and do this assessment to see where, we, where things are working well and perhaps not working so well. So we wanted to use this method to help the US Postal Inspection Service examine operations at uh, there are five different types of processing facilities across the US to particularly identify instances of uh, risk to express mail revenue in the categories shown here. Uh, the express mail, for some reason, is unaccepted, and there's a revenue cost associated with that. It is short paid. What that means is I just mailed a $10 item, and I only paid $5 for it. So I'm not, the Postal Service is not getting adequately, adequately compensated. I talked a little bit about fraudulent postage. And the thing that was, has been particularly uh, effective about this approach is there's each of the assessments that are conducted at a site, and I'll tell you a little bit about the method in a moment, is, provides an opportunity for both local improvement at that particular facility, the postal inspectors working with the staff at that facility, but also all this data uh, uh, on these individual assessments is actually rolling up to USPS headquarters in Washington, D.C., and they're able to use this data to take a look systemically across the entire postal system to see, first of all, where are things, um, are there particular geographic regions or particular type of facilities where we keep seeing uh, categories of high risk? Or conversely, are there areas that seem to have really solved this problem well, and can we take those body of practices and actually propagate them through other parts of the postal system? And what they eventually, they're just starting down this path, but what they eventually wanted to do, want to do with express mail and maybe even other categories of mail, like priority mail and maybe even first class mail, is to come up with a, a vision for automated, database-driven, risk analysis across the entire mail stream. I mean, imagine that. Wouldn't that be great? So we're kind of in the very beginning stages of helping them think through that process. Um, the method itself um, is a one-day scripted interview, probably similar in many respects to what James Stevens described for ESC2M2, although this is not a self-assessment. Postal inspectors and trained teams come into the facility, but they work with the folks at the facility. They collect evidence on steps that are taken to prevent and detect risk and steps that are taken when a loss actually occurs. And so what we did is we took, let's see if I've got the numbers here, we took two practices from the mail induction process area and we took five practices from the mail revenue assurance process area, the two that I just described to you briefly. And we actually took one practice from organizational training and awareness out of the full body of RMM to make sure folks were properly trained in how to accept express mail. And, and we developed a, a bank of questions against each of those practices, and that's what the scripted interviews are. So 
what happens is uh, the team goes in, they ask each question of the staff on the site, and the question, the answer to the question is characterized in, using that same scale. You may remember that, that James described fully implemented, largely implemented, partially implemented, and not implemented. But it's applied at the question level. The extent to which the answer to that question really influences the overall achievement of the practice. And then uh, these, the answers to all these questions are rolled up using a heuristic to get to a high, medium, low score for each of the practices that I described to you. Again, there are eight practices. So remember we talked about the fact that we've got this huge 1,000-page model. And several people have said that you really customize and pick from it based on what your objective is. And you can actually go deep within a process area. Well, in this particular case, we've taken eight practices and developed an assessment method based on eight practices that is producing very valuable and meaningful results for this particular community. I think that pretty much covers what I want to say about that. OK, so I have one more case that I'd like to uh, spend, uh, spend some time on with you. And this has to do with international mail. Um, before I advance to the next slide, we're not yet using the international mail mail specific process area that I described to you, although uh, there certainly is a relationship here. I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about the Universal Postal Union and the role of the Postal Inspection Service in working with the Universal Postal Union to ensure the security of international mail. And, and I think a very novel application of not the RMM model, but the RMM appraisal method to a whole other body of standards promulgated by the Universal Postal Union. So, that's a little bit of a tee up. I hope you're following with me, but uh, I want to tell you a little bit about that. So how best to describe this? Um, so starting in 2010, uh, there were some pretty serious incidents of car cargo. Now, cargo does not come through the mail stream. Cargo is usually handled totally separately. But there were two documented cases of cargo coming in from Yemen that actually ended up successfully being placed on US-bound aircraft um, uh, being managed by the uh, United Postal or Parcel Service, so UPS, not USPS, and FedEx. And you know, more and more instances of terrorism being conducted through cargo, being conducted through the mails. And this really got the attention of the Universal Postal Union. And within the Universal Postal Union, there is actually a group called the Product Security Group, or excuse me, the Postal Security Group. And interestingly enough, so see if you can follow the dots with this, because it's kind of a little bit counterintuitive. Given that the US is the only country to have its own postal inspection service, the chief uh, Postal Inspec Inspector General of the United States Postal Inspection Service is the chair, has been invited to be the chair for this postal security group within the Universal Postal Union. So, you know, the, the, the chief uh, postal inspector general has a role within respect to U.S. domestic mail, but they're now being asked to, to uh, strategically work with the Universal Postal Union and chair the group that has to do with the safety and security and resilience of international mail. Obviously, you can see the vested interest there. So if our own Postal Inspection Service is helping, helping ensure that the international mail that comes into the US domestic mail stream is safe and secure, that's, that's an advantage to us. But it, it's also a greater good, kind of a good citizenship type of role for them to play. And what, in, in response to these cargo and mail issues with respect to particularly terrorist threats, the Postal Security Group decided to create two new standards under the aegis and sponsorship of the Universal Postal Union. And one of these was for the security of international mail processing facilities in these 192 member countries. And another one was more uh, comprehensive, rigorous screening of mail before it gets put on an airplane of any type, passenger airplane, cargo airplane, other, any other type of aircraft. And so they created two standards. And this, this, this was the part that I thought was just really brilliant on the part of the inspection service. The inspection service, not that, not that them coming to us is particularly brilliant, but the fact that they had this thought that they could use the CERT RMM appraisal method 
not the model, but the method, and, and see could that method be applied to these two new Postal Security Group standards to allow them to be as rigor rigorously assessed in these participating member countries as we espouse for appraising against the CERT Resilience Management Model. So you've got two new standards that have nothing to do with CERT RMM, but you're taking the appraisal method that we've developed here and apply it to assessing how, to what extent are the countries in, within the Universal Postal Union complying with these two new standards. I just thought it was really, really a, a visionary uh, approach to uh, helping the international community ensure greater security of the international mail stream. And it turned out that the standards were uh, accepted by the Congress in uh, Doha, Qatar, uh, a little over a year ago. And the po U.S. Postal Inspection Service, together with country teams, have actually gone out and conducted many uh, site assessments using this assessment method against these two standards. Let me tell you a little bit about the method and then an interesting anecdote about uh, the result. But one of the things I forgot to mention is um, the international mail stream and the entire postal international postal system is the largest physical distribution network in the world. If you take into account all the moving parts, all the different people, all the different facilities, both domestically and internationally, and I'll just give you the international figures, there are over 5.5 billion, with a B, 5.5 billion letters and 6 billion parcels that are shipped internationally every year. And all of them are individual points of potential hazard or failure in the international mail stream. So um, anyway, this appraisal method has been piloted. There's a pre-assessment questionnaire that's sent out to any site that's undergoing uh, the assessment, and currently it's on a voluntary basis. Um, we generate the kind of the standard red, yellow, green heat maps against, <laughs> what we actually did is we took each statement in the standard and made it a specific goal kind of like the model, RMM, and the sub-elements of each of those statements, we made a specific practice, and then we could apply the appraisal method in exactly the same way that we do for RMM. So anyway, a heat map is generated. Uh, everybody understands because all these member countries participated in the creation of these standards. And I have, I added a little uh, footnote at the bottom of this slide. Again, just this week we've published a fairly comprehensive definition of this method and the story that I've just told you a little bit about. And uh, you can certainly uh, take a gander at that if this is something that you're interested in. I'll tell you that as a result of one of these assessments that were done on site at a not to be named country, uh, the country postal postmaster general shut down the facility. They were so concerned with the exposures and uh, the potential gaps coming out of their, uh, both their facility and their air, airport screening uh, practices that they moved the international mail processing to a totally different facility with improved controls. So it has had a significant effect uh, in some countries. Um, other organizations that are looking at this hard and maybe uh, even looking at adopting a variation on this assessment method include the International Civil Aviation Organization, the International Air Transport Association, our own Transportation Security Administration, and the World Customs Organization. So this is really having a global impact and, and actually was a very modestly conceived effort. And one of the really cool things about this particular uh, method is we actually got into iPad app uh, the iPad app business, because all the postal inspectors that go out and conduct these appraisals, it's, uh, it's all done on an iPad app, and so they don't even have to take a whole lot of equipment with them when they conduct the appraisal. So that's kind of cool. All right, almost done. So I hope you've been able to follow with me some of these, uh, I think, pretty novel uh, and different types of business objectives that the Postal Service and the Postal Inspection Service have used to, uh, to take portions of RMM and apply them. And so here, what, here are what I believe are some of the key takeaways from what we've learned uh, in this particular engagement. Um, you can really take the body of knowledge that is the CERT resilience management model and when properly interpreted, you can apply it to, we've talked about the five different types of assets that, uh, that Nader and James Sabula describes. So you've got people, facilities, information, technology, supply chain, but in this case, we've added a new asset called mail. 
Um, and if, if, and if you're in your particular market sector or business, you have an asset type that really doesn't fit within the constraints of or the definition of the currently defined model, there's nothing to preclude you from creating a new asset type. Uh, I think we've demonstrated, although it's not for the faint of heart, new process area development does take some time because we had to go to site visits, we had to work with subject matter experts, we had to do a lot of collaborating because I know when I started working on this project, I knew absolutely nothing about how the mail stream works. And I'm certainly not an expert by any means, but I know a lot more and, and you need that level of understanding to actually create these new, uh, new process areas and can use them then in concert with the existing model, for example, if you were to dive into the mail induction process area or the mail revenue assurance process area, you would see that in the areas where discrepancies are identified, they view those as incidents just like we view them as incidents in the resilience management model in the in incident management and control process area. So you can actually invoke from these new process areas, you can actually invoke the other, other goals and practices within the model. Similarly for risk, there's no reason why, why they have to describe a whole risk management process in their specific work at, in the U, uh, US Postal Service. They can invoke the risk management PA within CERT RMM and be confident that they will have a robust risk management capability. And last but not least, as demonstrated by our work uh, with the Universal Postal Union and International Mail, even the appraisal method itself as a standalone artifact can be customized and applied to a wide range of business objectives. So I know it was a bit of a fire hose treatment, but we have podcasts, we have technical reports. Uh, the two technical reports that I just referred you to, if you go to Greg Crabb's podcast, they're actually, we've created big uh, wall posters that summarize the entire content of the technical report, which were given at a conference last week. So lots of good, uh, and go into the, the materials widget. Uh, they're all in the widget for, uh, for today's event, so I encourage you to take a look at those if you're interested. All right, Shane, how'd I do? Great, plenty of time <laughs> for questions. We got a couple of questions come in. Amy asked, many of the organizations we work with, large financials, would be able to show evidence they reach defined levels in most practices. However, failures have shown that while they talk the talk with all the right paperwork, controls, and committees, resilience is not embedded in their culture and into everything they do. Have you come across that in the past, and how would you address it? Uh, that is a fantastic question, and yes, it's very pervasive. It's something that we see all the time. And if you remember when Nodder spoke about, for those of you that were on the uh, webinar with us, Nodder spoke about the three types of models, a progression model, a capability maturity model, and a hybrid model. And what we typically see, uh, financial services sector is not the only sector that falls prey to this, but, but when you have a compliance and a checklist and a controls mentality, to security or to resilience where you say, okay, I have this list of things that I'm gonna do and maybe I've got some natural progression built into some controls being more sophisticated or more complete than other controls and I march through that list and I go check, 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 check. Again, necessary but not sufficient. You shouldn't be surprised that you don't have, uh, that that's not a cultural norm, that you don't have any stickiness or institutionalization of those practices if you do not have the organizational capability dimension that we talked about earlier today, that the practices are planned, that there's managed, that there's policy, that there's governance, that folks are trained in the use and execution of the practice and the process, that there's uh, regular measurement and regular reporting, that there's process improvement, that there's, in other words, like anything else, you, you can do something and you can do it in a locally optimized way, but if you really want that to have an impact across the organization, you need to weave it into, Nader uses a phrase, the DNA or the day-to-day -day operations or the fabric or the cultural norm of the organization. And uh, by virtue of the question, I'm not at all surprised that, uh, that that's, that's pretty common practice where, but I'm doing all the right things. I'm doing all the hygiene things. I'm doing everything that NIST told me to do. I'm doing everything that ISO 27XXX told me to do. Why am I still not, why is this still not working? And in most cases we find is because you're missing uh, a big part of the systemic or the institutionalizing factors that make a capability maturity model so hard to do. If any of you have tried to make change happen, any kind of change happen at a cultural level in an organization, it is daunting and it takes time and persistence and patience. 
Probably a little bit more than you wanted to no, know, No, great Shane, answer. But <laughs> Thank you. Next, from Carl asking, uh, what guidance does a CERT group provide for determining how much investment a company should make in their core operations versus how much they should invest in resiliency? It seems that all the money can't go to resiliency and starve out operations. Uh, again, another great question. Um, I, I know I hate when people do this to me, but I would answer the question with a question. How do you make other investment decisions in your organization? This is no different. How do you decide on a merger and acquisition? How do you decide on a new capital facility? Um, how do you have to present your business case up through your chain of command, potentially to the board, for a new major product or investing in a new market sector? And I would say that you subject your operations and, and what you need to do to be opera, operationally capable in a normal mode. That's one class of investment. And then how much do I invest in anticipation of disruption and stress of various types? And you know we, we've, we've kind of been a broken record about this, but it's a risk management proposition. But this investment decision should be no different than any other major investment decision you make in the organization. And the problem is that as we've come up through the security ranks and maybe even sometimes on the BCDR side, we think we're different. We think we're unique. We think we have different issues and risks and, and things that need to be considered. But I would, I've done a lot of work in the security governance space and policy space. And I would encourage you to take a look at how other investment decisions are made in your organization and capitalize on those processes for investing in operational resilience. Great. Uh, John asks, you mentioned iPad apps for, for the appraisal with the, the, the post service. Are these publicly available or are they made just uniquely for, for them? Uh, unfortunately, the, the latter. Um, they are unique and uh, for particular use of the U.S. Postal Inspection Service. Um, we really haven't taken that particular tool approach uh, much further. I'd sure like to see us do that. But right now, those, those artifacts are owned by the Postal Inspection Service. Okay, it looks like it'll, we have time for one more here from Todd asking, how might you use what you've learned in applying RMM to the resilience and security of mail? How will that be relevant for other large supply chains and transportation infrastructures? Oh, I like that question. That's a good one. Okay, so we're talking about mail, which is very specific. But think about any time you're trying to move something from point A to point B, you're trying to move mail, you're trying to move cargo, you're trying to move raw materials, you're trying to move people uh, in a transit system. Um, Nodder just last week was at the Transportation Research Board, which deals with all issues related to any kind of transportation infrastructure. So it occurs to us that some of this thinking about moving anything from point A to point B could benefit from some of the types of work and thinking that we've done for, uh, for mail as a, as a type of asset. So I'll, I'll leave that as a kind of a pro provocative ending for anybody who has that problem. Great, Julia, thank you very much. Excellent presentation.